Most of the games I run don't require a good deal of preparation. As a matter of fact, in a lot of ways, I boiled it down to a system that actually works fairly well for me. It changes whenever I particularly need to, depending on what it is that we're doing. I don't like spending a ton of time prepping for a game for a few reasons. One, I like to be surprised. I want things to happen that I'm not really counting on. Two, I don't want to waste time creating things I won't necessarily need unless I'm pretty sure I'm going to need it. And three, I don't want to have the, these encounters. Oh, you'll go to this encounter, you go to this encounter, then this will happen. Because things might and hopefully will change. Like, yes, I might know that you'll probably end up in the fight with the big bad or whatever. Depending on the kind of game we're doing, that might take some very different tacks. We had, during a Smallville campaign, we actually ended up with the players sabotaging the big bad at a TED Talk that he was given, which is not something I ever could have prepared for beforehand, but during the session, their thought was, hey, let's go take him down and make the whole world see what he's been doing. I'm like, awesome. Would not have planned that. Uh, during Legends of the Wulin game, my players decided they were going to kidnap the, the Emperor, take him with them on adventures, and make everyone think he's dead, then bring him back when they could take out some of the people who were going to take over. Again, would never have thought about that. If I would prepped a whole bunch of stuff thinking this will be what happened, I'd have wasted a lot of time. I didn't want to do that. Now, a good deal of what I'm going to talk about is I did not get from this book, but was pretty well put into words in this book in the same way that the author Vincent Baker did with essentially the way I tend to run games in Apocalypse World. It was kind of spooky. Dogs in the Vineyard is a game that I highly recommend checking out. I mean, one, fantastic game, but it's GM prep. While it is specific for the type of game it is, we are going town to town in what is the Old West, essentially, but uh, Mormon part of the Old West. While you're going town to town to all these places, you are discovering the sin and the problems that had happened there. And while his GM prep chapter focuses specifically on these towns and the people, it's essentially what I already do which was awesome to kind of see. So what this is not, this is not for dungeon crawl type GMing. That is a very different style of game. And it's not a type of style of game I have had any desire to play or run for a very long time. It's also not encounter-based GMing. The ones where it's like, you have this encounter, then this will happen, then there'll be this encounter. Uh, I'm not setting up the bases for my players to tag as they're going around the story because I don't know what the story is going to be yet. The fun of the role-playing games is creating the story as they go. Now, I was going to put up uh, Unknown Armies prep that I did the other day, but I had some problems with the microphone, and so that didn't work the way it should have. But you would have seen this much fuller in action, and I'll probably do it a couple times. And I'll do a version of it here that will be a quicker one, but there will be some times I'll put up some of the prep for games I'm running that do require a little bit more prep, because some of the ones I run really don't, uh, or require very little. Pow Powered by the Apocalypse style games, if I'm doing Smallville, there's a minimum amount of prep that needs to be done there, because a lot of the stuff is kicked up, kicked off by the players. The kind of games I run primarily deal with the following. You have characters in dynamic action that the players will have a cause to run in with. A situation is happening and the players will be a part of it because it's part of the buy-in of the style of the campaign we're doing, because I put in the hooks to make them care about what's going on, or because it comes out of specific things that they have done previously. So to here is show you, these are essentially in about three to five steps. These are the ways in which I prefer to GM or per do my GM prep. Background situation, discover who the major NPCs are, what their plans are going forward, create an inciting incident, and then kind of decide how major characters will react to how the players get involved. All of this comes down to you create the situation and then you drop the players in to see what happens. You have not created how things are going to go, but you have the momentum going forward and you know what everybody wants. So all you really have to do is decide how does this character, who we already know what they want, going to react to what the players do, which, to be honest, is not that much different from what a player is doing. A player is looking like, I know this character, I know what's happening, how do I react to the thing that just happened? As a GM, and this is one of the things I'll get into in another video, jumping in and out of the characters, doing something very similar to what I put on the instant characters video, where you're just asking those questions, you're doing it in just a much quicker and usually how it associates with the player 
but you're doing it pretty much the same way so you can keep that up going up quickly. So if you've got your foundation, the rest is easy. So to show you a quick example, so I'm going to show you a quick example. We're going to put something together as we go. So I am going to take, let's say, our standard fantasy situation. A good deal of role-playing games are essentially a group of adventurers who are specifically going out to do something. I don't do as much with the going out into the wilderness or dealing with dungeons particularly. What I like is more interpersonal uh, characters going on. So uh, actually, I'll change it a little bit up. Let's do something with, like, say, Legends of the Wu Land. I'm going to take some ideas from there. So we have, for our background, let's say, I'll take what my players actually did, where they kidnapped the Emperor. And they took the Emperor when well, they kidnapped him. They essentially gave him an opportunity to go and be the Wuland hero he's always wanted to be. Uh, they are going to a place called... I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but I'll call it, for our purposes, Sword Heaven. This is a place where ancient swords of power are kept. What they're hoping to do is actually get, they want to get the one of the swords for the prince to help show his, the fact that he's the emperor. That's what the players want. So I have to decide what's going on. So my first thought is the background situation. I need something for you happening so they can't just sort of stop by and take over. So I think what I'm going to have to do is uh, emissaries of the enemies. I'm going to fix that spelling. Basically, emissaries of the enemies of the PCs, uh, the advisors who took over, the advisors who took over have sent someone to Sword Heaven to steal one of these, basically take one of these swords so that when they bring it before people, here is a symbol of their background. So at the very beginning, what we have is an, an, another enemy going there to sort of pick it up before the players have arrived. This stuff was already set in motion before the players decided. Um, the advisors took over to have sent someone to get... I'm going to call it the Emperor Sword for right now. We would do something a little more uh, interesting and unique later, but right now it's it's the MacGuffin. The MacGuffin is a sword that proves his uh, what he's that he is part of the Emperor. That's not my background situation yet, though. That's just kind of this will be the thing that makes it so the players have a little more difficulty. So there are two priests there that are part of Sword Heaven. I'm going to call them for e purposes of ease right now. Evil Priest and Good Priest. Evil Priest uh, has been bought, essentially. Uh, the Good Priest uh, wants to help the rightful Emperor, who he thinks is dead right now. He doesn't trust this guy who is showing up. So, the situation happening, the currently uh, Evil Priest is gathering his sort of political might against the good priest. The good priest is trying to gather his as well. Uh, good priest is wanting the emissary to go through the trial. Actually, he wouldn't want the emissary. He wants the leader to go through the trials. So the good priest wants a new leader to go through the trials. He is refuses to give his voice to giving up the sword and is trying to sway others. So the base situation we've got in here, we, the players come into an argument between two different sides, good priest, evil priest. Evil priest is helping the enemy of the, uh, the enemy of the players. So, major NPCs, I haven't given them actual names yet, and I'll do that. That would, would be something I do later. So we're just going to say, we've definitely got the Emissary. Stop giving me those. Let's do that. Evil Priest. Good Priest. I also kind of like the idea of, I'll call him... Wormy Priest, he's that, that kind of guy who's just trying to get some more power for himself and will help whatever side uh, he thinks will do best. 
Uh, and how about the... We'll say head... Head of the train, the, the priest. The priest who's helping everyone out. Uh, we already know what some of these do. I'm going to say Wormy Priest is going to be the one who might go... Well, he, he's he's trying to figure out what are these people doing? Who wants? Who's going to win? He wants to figure out which side he can win on. Head the training priest. I like the idea that he is kind of on the good priest's side ideologically, but realizes peace is necessary for the kingdom. So what he wants is he wants things to be if the if giving it to these people will stop the war that's happening, then it's better to do that than to withhold it. But he doesn't think that it should go. So, plans going forward. Uh, I think Wormy Priest is going to whisper in Training Priest's ear, uh, pull him into pull him into the, uh, the fold of Evil Priest. Uh, other priests will start to fall in line. And I like the idea that good priest sees this as a breach of what they can do. Good priest is going to try to steal the sword. Uh, and I think what's going to happen is he'll get caught because essentially uh, evil, like emissary, evil priest, and wormy priest are much better about actually being. Um, evil than good priest is. This is the kind of thing that they expect him to do because he's ideologically against it. Uh, and then the head of training priest is going to be put in that very difficult position that the good priest has crossed a line he's not supposed to, and the sword would have to be given up, and that would be taken back to legitimize the current heir. So that's that's the plans going forward. And that's also, in some respects, well, that's how the major characters, that, what they're planning on doing. So now you've got the inciting incident. So this is what's going on. and This gives me most of what I'm going to need. Um, how do we get the players involved? And there's a couple different places I can think of. I don't necessarily want to put them towards the end when all this has happened, because some of this is going to be interesting to see. However, I want it pretty close to when the good priest is going to try to steal the sword. So... We'll say Wormy Priest will meet them at the gates. He'll be the one that's sort of out there. He's going to be dismissive. But the players will see the emissary is there. So because of the situation that's being built, the players would already have a reason to do the things uh, that will make this interesting because they're there to do to get the sword. The evil emissary from the people who overthrew the person that they're now protecting is there and they're going to find out uh, pretty quickly that he's also there from the sword. And I like the idea I don't want to get straight into them stealing the sword yet. I want that to wait a bit but I also want it to be not far from here. So that's our inciting incident. This one's actually pretty simple because it builds off of what players have already been doing. Uh, doing. So how are they going to react? Emissary would recognize both the players and the Emperor. Uh, if he does that, he's going to try to have them killed, because he's got soldiers and such with him, because they are prepared to take this, if necessary, by force. They would rather do it by uh, negotiating and doing it this way. So he, he has his mook sort of down there, ready to go if necessary. He'll try to have them killed, because once he recognizes any of them, Stuff's real immediately. Evil Priest. Evil Priest is not going to be let in on what's going on. His entire thing is, depends on what the players want to do. If they tell them that he's there for the sword, that becomes, if they don't mention why, that becomes leverage to give it to an actual member of the current rulers, of the current ruling faction. And if they do say what happened... Evil Priest will... I kind of like the idea of him spinning it so that he would try to come out good, but that's what Wormy Priest is already there for. So we'll keep... He'll go after the players to try to solidify their support. 
or hit to solidify his support with the incoming court. So those are the things he's going to do. Good priest, I get first. Would find them players as distraction. If they find out it's the emperor, uh, he essentially is able to have his trump card, but they're not going to allow him to tell them it's the emperor because they need to keep the emperor on the down low because a lot of people are looking for the emperor. Um, so in that case, he'll get their help stealing it. And at this point, he'll also bring in head of training priest, which will give them more options. Wormy priest, yeah, Wormy priest try to get in good with the players to see if they can he can uh, gain anything from them. And depending on what he thinks he can get out of it, he'll either become an ally or an enemy, but he's always willing to betray them. Uh, head of training priest, he'll for the most part remain neutral uh, unless he knows the emperor is there. I have a game for, if I was running it this evening, I have the game now. So your background situations, major NPCs, what their plans are going forward before the players show up. The thing that makes your players get involved, care, and what starts it off. That is the first couple minutes before the movie begins, how those major characters are going to react to the players being there. That is everything you need to create an evening plus campaign, even, of play. Hope that is useful for you. Uh, if you like it, please subscribe, share it with anybody that you know, uh, and I will see you later. Have yourself a good one.